Hello, Esperanza here. We are here at the David Brower Center at Berkeley, and uh, I'm here with Dimitri Gershenson, who is the graduate director of the Berkeley Rural Energy Group, um, and we are at the Innovating Energy Access for Remote Areas, Discovering Untapped Resources Symposium on the 11th of April. So hi, Dimitri. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'd love to know how you became involved in organizing such an amazing group of, and gathering of, of individuals who are changing people's lives in these remote areas. Well, thanks so much for the compliment of calling it amazing. Uh, it's been maybe eight months mm -hmm. in the making, uh, a little longer. Uh, so I, I've been at Berkeley now for two years. Mm -hmm. and UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley, yes. I'm a PhD student. Mm -hmm. uh, I work on energy access in emerging markets, mainly in East Africa, mm -hmm. although originally before coming here my work it was in Latin America. I lived in Honduras for two years and worked there on partially energy access issues in rural areas. And so last year in February I went to Berlin for a conference to present a paper mm -hmm. at the MES conference that happens every other year mm -hmm. and started talking with the organizers about doing another event and we decided that it would be a good idea to collaborate. So we were initially planning a very short, small, 30-person little meeting, mm -hmm. and it turned into this, which is now, I think we've had over 70 registrations. We've had definitely over 80 people show up um, between local volunteers and uh, that are all Berkeley students mm -hmm. and uh, international scholars, people from, from the Global South, people from Europe, uh, a lot of people from Southeast Asia mm -hmm. and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, so it's it's been quite a ride. That's fantastic. Um, so, how did you become involved with developing um, innovation in rural and remote areas? So, I, I guess it started with my work. Uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer mm -hmm. in Latin America in Honduras, and I spent quite a lot of time looking at both cook stove interventions and uh, electrification in rural areas. You know, I saw a lot of flaws in the way things are done, um, both by uh, small local NGOs that just lack the capacity, but also by really very large players who I won't name, but uh, I, I saw a lot of programs fail, uh, some gracefully, some not so much. Mm -hmm. And I realized that there must be a better way. And so I uh, became very curious as to how this could be achieved, what are the best practices, and then where do we think we know what we're doing, but really we can do a lot better. And so I, I'm actually interested in kind of the finance side of energy access, so how can we catalyze the level of investment that's necessary to bring universal access to mm -hmm. uh, the world? So, you know, if, if in we have... In a sustainable way. Huh? In, in a sustainable way, mm -hmm. of course. I mean, yes, you could do it with oil and coal, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but it's actually cheaper. Uh, to do it with solar and mm -hmm. with wind and hydro and biomass um, for a lot of reasons. And, you know, we could talk about that for hours. Mm -hmm. But uh, the real piece is, you know, now that we know that we can do it technologically and now mm -hmm. that we know what the best practices and policy are, the real question is how do we drive the level of investment that we need? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, in the next 20 years, $10 trillion, mm -hmm. which seems like an incredibly huge, massive number, but it's trivial in comparison to the global economy. Uh, over that same time scale. So, um, for those of the, who are interested in this topic and who aren't here today, why don't you provide us with some main takeaways uh, that came out of this convention? So, you know, unfortunately, as an organizer, I got to see very little, but mm -hmm. I have read a lot of the papers, and I was, uh, as, as part of being on the committee, this kind of scientific committee, I reviewed a lot of the work that was submitted here. I was able to place a lot of papers into context. I think uh, the takeaways are that, uh, one, um, information and communication technologies and mm -hmm. big data are going to make a huge difference in the energy access space, mm -hmm. both from the side of being able to monitor how things work and really see results, uh, but also from the side of financing and being able to have people pay for interventions over time. Mm -hmm. So rather than you know, having there be this massive upfront barrier to getting a solar panel or a, a light or a cook stove, you can make payments look a lot more like what people are used to, which is 
is you know a few dollars a day. Um, so uh, information and communication technologies like mobile phones, mm. remote sensors, they allow Delta. people to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's one big takeaway. I think two, we really need to start thinking about doing things at scale, uh, and at the scale of things like the program in Bangladesh, where they deploy 70,000 systems. Mm -hmm. uh, in order for people to truly solar home systems, solar home systems mm -hmm. uh, it, these aren't large. You know, we're talking mm -hmm. about a few watts, mm -hmm. 10, 20, 30 watts. But that can power one. So that can power four lights, mm -hmm. a fan, one uh, maybe a DC television. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not crazy, but it mm -hmm. makes an absolute fantastical difference mm -hmm. for a household that has never mm -hmm. had power. Um, and when you start looking at things at that level, it becomes much more attractive mm -hmm. to donors and funders, private funders, people who want returns, mm -hmm. not just you know charities and big development organizations. And then the question is, okay, well, how can we apply some of the lessons learned from these really large programs mm -hmm. and take them to the private sector and say, okay, you want to be involved in this space, a massive market with incredible growth potential. Mm -hmm. and how can you apply some of these things to business models rather than big you know, government-sponsored intervention? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of things that work very differently. Um, so I think the, the importance of scale uh, is something that comes up a lot. Um, and then, you know, I think one thing that has always comes out of conferences, but really was obvious here, was the need for collaboration on an international level for information sharing and for really crossing the boundaries that people typically don't uh, cross. So having people who work on cook stoves really talk to people who work on solar home systems or people who work on one type of technology really talk to others because there's a lot of crossover, a lot of interesting lessons that can be applied from one space to another. Mm -hmm. They just never happen. So you'll have these big meetings where people are like, okay, we're only gonna talk about electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, but you can learn a lot from toaster ovens that applies to electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is kind of a silly example, but that's how it works here. And so there's a lot of people who have come here who have never talked to somebody who works in the solar space. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they come into the same room, they start talking about approaches to implementing a project or researching something, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. I just had this idea. You know? Why should people become interested in a topic such as providing sustainable energy to these areas who don't have that? Well, so from, from one perspective, it's that um, we have a world in which one third of the population either doesn't have electricity or can't count on the electricity they have. Two billion? Almost two billion people. Actually, more than two billion people. I mean, we're talking 1.4 don't have access, and another billion, so we're almost talking two and a half billion people, don't have access to, to consistent power. You can generalize in that way. And electricity does a lot for the world. I mean, without electricity, you can't have healthcare, or real healthcare, you can't have really effective education, mm -hmm. you can't have civic participation, you can't have uh, the levels of productivity people might want, you can't have businesses growing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really, like, socioeconomic development mm -hmm. cannot occur without electricity. Electricity isn't the only thing that creates mm -hmm. socioeconomic growth. But if you want to think about a world in the future where we live in an environment where we are still able to consume to a degree that makes us comfortable, but we do it through a way that has minimal impact mm -hmm. on the global climate and environment. We need to think about that now, mm -hmm. and we need to think about all of these people that are going to get electricity in the future, mm -hmm. and we need to intervene before they say, okay, well, we're gonna just burn coal, we're gonna get diesel generators, we're gonna do all these other things, where at that point, there's no way of stopping it. Once you have an incumbency, you know, once you have a big national grid that runs on coal, it's really hard to change to solar or hydro or wind or biomass. But uh, if you can start from the beginning and really deliver solutions that are cost effective, but also sustainable, the implications are huge. Mm -hmm. I think that's why people should care. I, I think it's part is this climate argument. You know, we kind of want to be able to live on this planet. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking at four or five, six degrees, then it's not going to be so comfortable. But we also want to have people have access to the things that we have access to. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're sitting here having a video interview on a MacBook Pro. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a luxury that most people can't, don't have. Mm -hmm. um, but why should why should? I mean, this is kind of it's a luxury, right? But people should have lighting. They should have telephones. They mm -hmm. should have television. They should have radio. They should have access to information and knowledge mm -hmm. and the, the kind of the rich wealth of, of data that's available to mm -hmm. everybody. Um, I think that.
that's that's important. So to end this, how do you see this symposium come about? Would it extend to just more than the Berkeley group? Um, perhaps become a global symposium for you know providing uh, other people who are also interested in this. I just are there other symposiums such as this? I mean, explain to me the dynamics. Of right. So I, you know, for me, a dream conference mm -hmm. would be to bring the private sector mm -hmm. and academia mm -hmm. and the government mm -hmm. all in one space. I mean, we'd need 500, 1,000 people mm -hmm. to sit down together. Around the world. Around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to have representatives of all the continents, of all the major countries where mm -hmm. there's significant deprivation mm -hmm. or of access. Mm -hmm. And you need to say, okay, we're all going to sit down together and we're going to go over all the things that we're here today. Because mm -hmm. a lot of us don't know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us don't have opportunities to hear it from peers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, it would be like a week. It could be called the Sustainable Energy for All Conference, you mm -hmm. know, partner with the UN and the World Bank mm -hmm. who have this big initiative that's trying to actually bring this level of access to everybody by 2030, you know, have all these people sit down in one room and do everything from panel discussions and keynotes, but also do kind of less traditional things that don't happen at our conference, like trade shows mm -hmm. and tech demos and, mm -hmm. you know, quick five minute talks like TED, you know, really kind of exciting uh, conversation space where information is shared freely, where people commit to sharing data and really talking about the details of their work. Because in the end, you know, lessons learned, oh, sure, everybody knows that feed-in tariffs are important. Mm -hmm. Or everybody knows that you know, subsidies are important. It's like, well, okay, let's talk about the details. How mm -hmm. did you do it? How did you pull it off? Mm -hmm. What are the pieces that are absolutely necessary for this to work? And that's where it gets really interesting. And so I hope that we, you know, here at, at the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory and the Berkeley World Energy Group at UC Berkeley, we can play a role mm -hmm. in facilitating mm -hmm. this kind of conversation. And so we've been in talks with Microenergy Systems, which mm -hmm. are a core organizer at this event. We've also talked with universities in Bangladesh and in India uh, and in Kenya. And now we just talked to some folks in Luxembourg mm -hmm. and everybody wants to do this. So we're hoping to kind of bring together a committee and mm -hmm. start this, this process rolling so that maybe in two, three years we could actually, uh, we could swing it. Well, that is definitely quite a vision, and let's hold the Nietzsche up to that vision, as, as this is definitely very inspiring to be here. Um, and thank you so much for no, convening this. My pleasure. All right.